If I had unlimited space, what would be my dream aquarium? How do I handle soft waters and pH changes? How do I choose new fish? Today, I'm gonna to answer all those questions and more. Hey fish friends, how's it going? Hope you're doing well. My name is Zenzo from Tozawa Tanks. Now what I thought would be fun today at the end of the year, I think you guys are seeing this at the very end of the year, is to answer some questions from a lot of the viewers uh, that I may not have answered before and might be fun to make a video on. So I posted a poll on my community tab and many of you had asked a few questions and I kind of went through and picked a few to answer today. Now, in the future, I might do this again. So if you do want to have one of your questions answered in the future, comment down below and uh, I'll go back and read the questions on this video if I do want to make another one of these kind of answer the viewers questions video. Now, the first question I'm gonna answer today is in regards to pH. And this is uh, from Colby Pittman. And Colby asks, uh, what to do about pH swings when trying to keep fish that need higher pH uh, than your uh, tap water. So that is a common issue that a lot of people have. In fact, I have that issue uh, where I live here in San Francisco. Um, we have a very weird water situation where the city uh, treats the water with chloramine, which is not ideal. Uh, it's great for you know humans because it's more stable, but for fish keeping, it's really not what we want, but it is what it is. So we have high pH, chloramine and uh, very low uh, mineral content. The water is very soft. So what I do is I try to put crushed coral in every one of my aquariums where I know that those fish thrive in having you know a higher mineral count or you know a higher pH. So um, all of my African cichlid aquariums have uh, crushed coral or aragonite, which is essentially the same thing. My brackish tanks all have aragonite or crushed coral. So uh, even my live bear. So what I do is I just make sure that those aquariums where I know the fish do require a little bit more, um, I'll just have crushed coral and or aragonite in there as a substrate or I'll keep it in bags sometimes. And then what I'll do is I'll add buffers. Now I know some people don't like adding buffers and minerals, but in my case, because the water is so soft here um, with that high pH, it's kind of weird. Um, I do add those into my aquariums. Now, if you live in an area where you have soft water, probably the easiest thing to do is to have some crushed coral. You know, basically you wanna do like a pound uh, per 10 gallons. So if you have a 20 gallon aquarium, just put a couple pounds of uh, crushed coral either in the substrate, uh, you can have a full substrate bottom of coral if you want, uh, or just keep it like in little bags. You can put it inside your hang on the back filter or inside your canister filter. So it is a very convenient way of helping to buffer the aquarium and uh, keep it at a level where you want it to be. The next question is uh, kind of related to that and I thought I would kind of address this as well. Um, this one, it comes from, uh, I wanna say Zhe Yang. Hopefully I'm pronouncing your name correctly. But uh, the question is, I've recently moved and live in the country, meaning I live on well water, but my, my home has a water cleaning and softening system. It's killing my, um, my plants and, my, and the ecosystem. And essentially, how do you manage it with, uh, if you have a water softener and you want to basically change the parameter? So I don't know how many aquariums you have or how large they are, but in your situation, because you're on well water and it is going through some type of system, um, one, can you bypass that system? So do you have the ability of drawing water from the well and having it go to a separate water supply before it goes to your water softener? If that's the case, then I would suggest just having a T somewhere where you can turn a valve and have some water go to another holding tank or something like that in order to have that for your aquariums. If you don't have that uh, ability, then I would recommend um, again, getting like a large uh, water barrel that you can um, put water into there. And then um, if you don't want to like have a RO system, which you mentioned, you don't want to have a full RO system. What you could do is uh, have the water go into your holding tank, your barrel of water, like 35 to 55 gallons, something like that. It could be like a large Rubbermaid garbage can or something. And then I would, again, have some crushed coral in that water. And then you can add some buffers or minerals to the water which will help to uh, make it a little bit harder. You're not gonna have that same softness. And then when you are ready to uh, you know, add that water to your aquariums, you can just drop in a submersible pump and then use that water for your water changes. The next question is in regards to YouTube. And I get this question a lot uh, in various forms and fashions. 
Um, this was from uh, Riff Waters, and Riff is asking, uh, Hi Zenzo, what are your thoughts on people starting new fish YouTube channels? Are there too many already for another to be impactful, assuming it would be for fun and not for income? So my answer is, uh, if it's just for fun, then do whatever you wanna do. If you just wanna like say, hey, you know, I just wanna make YouTube videos and share my aquariums or what I'm doing with my plants or my fish or whatever, then just do it, like no big deal. I and mean, that's what I did when I first started a few years ago is I had no idea about what I was gonna do. I just got my cell phone and made some videos and a few people watched them. So um, if that's the case, then yes, I would say that's just fine. If you're really trying to carve out a niche for yourself and, um, you know, kind of make it on YouTube, then I would say that there are a lot of fish people on YouTube, obviously. So um, if that is the case, and do something different, do something that differenti differentiates you from the other creators. So try to be different, try to stand out, try to be unique, and hopefully you're doing it in a way that is entertaining and educational and people will watch. So this next question is actually my favorite question, and this is the one that kind of made me wanna make this video instead of just answering questions in the community tab. So this one is, if you had unlimited space, how big would your dream tank be and what would you stock or aquascape with? Aquascape it with. And this is from VitFam. And this is something that I've talked about before in live streams, but I've gone beyond just fantasizing about this. I've actually like broken out the tape measure before, like measured out like on the floor, how big the tank should be if I had like my dream tank and what would go in it and how it would be filtered and all this kind of stuff. So I have gone through extensive like plans in my head and maybe one day if I live somewhere where it would make sense, I might do this. But essentially what it would be is it would be like a 12 foot long aquarium and that 12 foot long aquarium would be uh, sectioned off into different areas. So it would be 12 feet long. I think I decided that it should be four feet front to back. And then I think I decided that it should be, uh, I wanna say it was like 30 inches tall or something like that. So very large aquarium. I don't know how many gallons that is off the top of my head, but I can calculate that later and put it down here. Um, but essentially what I would do is I would have that aquarium and I would have it into different sections. So one section would be just for my Malawi cichlids. So I'd have um, probably peacocks and buna and some smaller haps in there. Um, that would probably be like a five foot section by four feet. So five by four by 30 inches tall, so quite large. So I could have you know plenty of Malawi cichlids in there and I, I would do like a cool rockscape. I'd probably do like a big mound of rocks in the middle, uh, which would be good for the Mbuna and then lots of open space all around for the other fish to swim around. Um, and then the second section, and then in between each section is gonna have um, basically a barrier between the two, but that barrier is actually looking like rock. So it would look like a rock wall that water can pass through, but you know, like a screen there, so fry or anything can't get through, but just the water can pass through, so they're all sharing the same water. And then the next section, it would be like a Tanganyikan section for medium to larger size Tanganyikan fish. And then same thing with that uh, kind of that wall area. And then that last area is gonna be for um, my smaller Tanganyikan fish. So I would have a Malawi uh, section, a Tanganyikan section for larger Tanganyikans, and then a small Tanganyikan section for like my shell dwellers, some of my smaller rock dwellers, something like that. So obviously lots of rock work in there, and uh, that would be my dream. I would have a big giant sump that would filter the whole thing with like a refugium so I could grow life plants down there for filtration. So yes, I have thought about this extensively, and maybe one day I'll build this tank. So the next question I thought was pretty important, so I wanted to add that on here because it's something that I know comes up quite a bit, and it is something that people should think about and be aware about, um, and that's in regards to fish medications. So this came from Alec McCullough, and Alec asked, uh, medications often have exp expiration dates. Have you seen these to be less effective past their date? Um, what I will t tell you is, uh, yes, they do have expiration dates. In fact, uh, I just grabbed a box of my supply here, and this uh, box of Fritz Expel P is, uh, has an expiration date of um, November 7th, 2022, meaning that after November 7th, um, it's expired essentially. Is, that, is the medication effective beyond that date? Probably, but I am assuming that uh, in the manufacturing process, you know, the chemists and, and you know, they've all kind of figured out the degradation of the efficacy of the medication past a certain date. So just like, you know, when we go to, you know, 
the, the pharmacy to you know buy some aspirin or ibuprofen or something like that, it's also gonna have an expiration date. Will it still cure your headache or reduce the inflammation if you're past the expiration date? Yeah, probably, but do you really want to trust a medicine that's supposed to be fixing something inside your body if it's old? Uh, in, in my opinion, it would be better just to you know dispose of the medication properly and just get a new one. So if I have old medicine in the cupboard, I look at it and say, oh, this expired two years ago. And you know, maybe we weren't sick and we never needed the cold medicine, but we're like, oh, we're not gonna use it. We'll just go to the pharmacy and get new stuff. Same thing with the fish meds. Um, could it still work? Yeah, probably. But you know, you have to kind of think about, is it worth it? You know, if you, if you really love your fish and if your fish is sick or has a parasite or an infection and you need to treat it, then I would just say, as you get close to those expiration dates, just order a new one. It's kind of like, you know, having something that you don't necessarily need, but you may need in the future. And if you don't have it, you're going to want it. Kind of like insurance. Like, you know, we all pay for insurance for home, automobile, whatever it is, health, life. Hopefully we never need it, right? But in the event that something happens, at least we had it. So kind of treat it the same way as far as, you know, it's it's a good to have in your cupboard. You should have some in your in your in your uh, supply, but if it expires and just get new stuff. This next question is from Will C. And Will asks, what, what's your approach to picking out a new fish or setup to work with? Now, when it comes to getting new fish, uh, for me, I think more about what look I'm going for before I decide on the fish. So I might say, oh, I wanna have a brackish aquarium that's 20 gallons, with some rock work in there and some plants, what fish would go well in that size aquarium? So I went through that very same thing with one of my tanks back here. So I'll kind of go through that process and think about the aesthetic that I'm going for before I choose the fish. Now, initially, I, I knew I wanted to have Mbuna and I wanted to have peacocks and I wanted to have an Oscar and those kind of things. So when I know that I want a certain fish, I'm going to create that environment for them. So I'm gonna do my research, I'm going to get my supplies, set up that aquarium that would be optimal for keeping them in a little glass box, right? So um, obviously in those situations, I'm planning for the fish that I'm getting. Um, but in a lot of cases, I don't know if I have an empty tank, what fish is going in there. In fact, I have two aquariums right now in this room that don't have fish in them at all. I escaped them the way that I wanna escape them one of them, eh, the other one I like is just fine, but I haven't 100% decided on what fish are going in there. So um, what I'll do is I'll kind of think about, okay, the tank is ready. This is the look that I'm going for. This is the activity that I want in this aquarium. And then I'll go out and find those fish. So that's how I treat it. Everyone's different, but uh, kind of two ways. If I know the fish, then I'm gonna create the tank for them or I'll create the scape and then find a fish that's inhabitable, that would be inhabitable in that tank after the fact. So the last question is kind of a fun question. This has nothing to do with fish. So if you've made it this far and you like this video, give it a thumbs up. Don't forget to comment down below if you want to possibly have your question answered in the future. I may or may not get to it, but write it down anyway, because I'll probably read it and may answer it anyway. So, um, but this last question is a non-fish question. So if you're sticking around, then this is just kind of bonus for you. Um, and this is from TJ Autocross. So obviously from his name, TJ Autocross, he's into autocross. Autocross is basically taking your vehicle onto a uh, controlled course, like a giant parking lot with cones, and you would go through a basically a small race course in a timed, uh, timed event. So you know, a giant empty parking lot, you go out there with your car, you go through the cones, and once you cross the line, they stop the clock and you basically have your time. So in addition to fish, I'm also into motorsports. I recall a video where you talked about your M3, would like to know more about that. So um, yeah, I have an I have a M3. It's actually, right now it's December, whatever it is, end of December. And I don't even know what day it is half the time, just because I work all the time. So it's kind of no big deal, but, um, it's winter, it's been raining a lot, so basically I washed it, prepped it, covered it, and it just sits in my garage covered on a battery tender. And it may sit there for a couple months without me touching it at all. But um, it's a BMW M3, it's got a, um, it's got the S65 engine in it, which is the naturally aspirated V8, uh, which I love. It's a 
fun car. I have very low miles on it. I don't drive it very often because uh, it's kind of like my fun weekend car. I have done some track days on it uh, in it as well. Um, and then, yes, I do have a motorsports background, which you probably heard of as well. I used to race uh, semi-professionally, I guess you would call it. Uh, I did get paid, but I spent a lot of my own money as well. So between the amount of money that I spent and the amount of money that I made, it was kind of like you make a little bit of money. So it's not like you're a professional where you're just kind of living on racing. It was kind of like racing was paying for racing kind of a thing. But um, I raced motorcycles, I raced uh, 125cc carts and uh, had, you know, a couple successful years where I was supported by uh, like Suzuki North America as an example. But um, yeah, tons of fun. Uh, I'm still walking, which is great. I still can, you know, move my body and stuff like that, which for a lot of motorcycle racers, that is not the case. Uh, I'm much heavier now than I used to be. Obviously, to fit on a motorcycle, you want to be much, much lighter. So I was at that time a good 35 plus pounds lighter than I am now, obviously the same height. So anyway, um, that's the motorsport story. So if you made it this far, then hopefully you like that little bonus material. Don't forget to like this video. Don't forget to subscribe if you have not done so already. Thanks for watching. Have a happy new year. We'll catch you on the next one.